Wonderful is my Redeemer, wonderful is He. Saving me from sin and sorrow, watch the Calvary. Wonderful the Prince of Glory, mighty God is He. Wonderful is my Redeemer, wonderful to me. Wonderful. We are in a study entitled um, General Bible Introduction. What does that mean? Nobody knows. Uh, so we've cha I've changed the title to this. The inspiration, the transmission, and the translation of the Word of God. So that's what we've been studying. And if you haven't really been keeping up, we are in the 17th lesson of that study. So that's quite a few lessons that we've been involved in. Uh, I was going to try to uh, end by today and that isn't going to happen. Uh, there's a hurricane that happened. Uh, Vic was gone for a week and so I'm going to have to extend it for two or three more weeks in order to get all the information uh, that I want to get out. Plus, um, for some reason, our Bible classes always get shortened rather than lengthened because y'all want to out of here at 12 o'clock, right? Okay, I thought, I thought I'd get a good amen out of that. And uh, so, uh, you know, when you start at a quarter till, it's hard to get much in in 15 minutes. So uh, we'll do our best. I do have notes for you for today, so if we could get somebody to hand these out, I would appreciate it. <clears throat> I hope I made enough copies. I think I made uh, 55 copies, so maybe we'll have enough for everyone who's here. As they're handing those out, I'll be going through the introduction and just listen very closely uh, to the introduction. If you have a new, modern translation of the Bible and you get to Mark 16, verse 8, you may have a gap in between 16, 8 and 16, 9. And it may read something like this. Now listen to what it says. The most reliable early manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20. Now that is a direct quote from the New International Version. That's what it says right in between Mark 16, 8 and 16, 9. Okay? Sometimes there's not a, a break in between 16.8 and 16.9, there's only a footnote that is put on the ninth verse. And that may read something like this. Some of the oldest manuscripts omit from verse 9 through 20. Now that's a direct quote from the New American Standard Version. Okay, so it has a footnote, and at the bottom, that is exactly the way the footnote reads. Other versions may put the footnote at verse 20. Okay, so there's no break, and yet you get to verse 20, and there's a footnote, so you go down to the bottom. I know we adults, we most of the time ignore footnotes. Guys, don't ignore footnotes, okay? Uh, pay attention to those footnotes. And uh, you see this footnote, and it may read something like this. Verses 9 that should be through 20. And I apologize, I haven't had time to uh, go through this and proof it yet. So uh, make the changes as we go. Verses 9 through 20 are bracketed in the NU text. That's one of those Greek texts that I was talking to you about. Okay, uh, It's Nestle's text and we, uh, that we were talking about. But uh, they're bracketed in the NU text as, watch this, not original. They are lacking in the Codices, Sinaiticus, and Codex Vaticanus. Although nearly all other manuscripts of Mark contain them. That is a direct quote from the New King James Version in the footnote. Okay? Now here's what we find. We have, first of all, uh, there is doubt placed in our minds about whether Mark 16, 9 through 20 belong in the text. And sometimes they just tell us that the oldest manuscripts don't contain these verses. Okay? Now, uh, does that make you wonder about anything? Does it, does it jog? I mean, does it kind of, you know, hit, hit you in your mind just a little bit? 
when it, when it says that? Nobody? Or do you just don't care? <laughs> you know? Uh, when I read that, I immediately think, boy, now, you know, they're, they're in my Bible, and folks, they're in the King James Version with no space, no footnote. Okay? They're just there. Okay? But your modern versions put this doubt about them. Okay? Uh, they talk about Notice how one says, they are not in the original. Now first of all, we don't have any what? Originals. We have copies of the originals, right? But it makes it sound as if um, Mark really didn't write these last verses to the Gospel of Mark. And then we finally have the New King James Version telling us exactly which sources that they are quoting from, and they quote from, Two codices, two codexes, two books okay, that are Greek text. One of them is referred to as the Sinaiticus, and the other is referred to as the Vaticanus. Okay? And I'll tell you this, most members of the church have no clue about either one of them. You know that? Has anybody in here ever studied about the Vaticanus or Sinaiticus? Even heard about them? Okay, uh, Jim? Uh, we'll talk. We'll, we'll talk about it, okay? Because it, it, it's interesting, all right. Um, and so, uh, the minute I read about the uh, Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus, um, you know, um, I'm intrigued, okay? Because number one, there's not very much information put out about them. Everybody hails them as the oldest manuscripts that we have today, and they don't have this ending. And folks, not only do they not have that ending, they do not have other passages of Scripture that we'll make mention of a little bit as we go through this lesson. I'm not going to finish this today, so every one of you in here have to come back next week. Okay? I mean, if, if you want to hear the end of this, okay, because um, I'll tear off your pages of notes and uh, you won't get to leave with them. Okay? So what I want to do in this lesson is I want to talk about these two uh, codices, okay, codexes, and um, just introduce them to you. And next week we'll kind of get into the nasty stuff about the two codexes, okay, and why there's this battle and war uh, with regard to these. Now, here's something you need to understand. Westcott Hort came along, and they had the Sinaiticus at their disposal, okay, when they started making their Greek text. The King James translators did not have the Sinaiticus or the Vaticanus to make any decisions upon, okay? They hadn't been brought to light in 1611. They were still hidden. They hadn't been found at that particular point in time. So they couldn't use them in the translation process. Uh, they were found later. So um, uh, the only one that was available when Westcott and Hort made their translation was the Vaticanus, okay? That was the only one they had access to, but it heavily, heavily, I'm sorry, they had access to the Vaticanus, not the Sinaiticus. It heavily influenced their translation of the Greek text. Okay? And here's the key. That is the primary Greek text that is used today in translation of all new modern versions. Okay? So, uh, whatever one modern version does, almost all the other modern versions do because they're translating from exactly the same Greek text for the most part. Okay, there'll be a few changes, but not a lot. Okay, so that's something that you uh, just need to understand. Let's talk about the Codex Sinaiticus. Okay, it is a Greek manuscript. It is a book. Okay, it's, it looks like a book. It's a very thick book, but it looks just like a book, like, like we'd have today. Um, and it is written in what are known as unseal Greek. Okay, what we mean by that is all the letters are capital letters. Okay, they don't have capitals and smalls. They just have all capital letters. Okay, so when you see it, uh, if you know the capital letters of the Greek language and you're able to read those letters, then you're able to read the, that unseal, okay, or that code, uh, codex. Uh, notice also it is written in the Koine Greek language, okay, which is the what? 
the common language of the people, uh, the common language of the Greek-speaking uh, community, even of Jesus' day. Greek was the common language, and uh, there was two kinds of Greek, classical Greek and Koine Greek, and Koine Greek was the everyday language of the people. Okay, so uh, two um, different not to totally different languages, just the way they were um, used in conversation versus maybe writing and things of that nature. Um, notice point number three under A there. It is believed that this particular codex is a copy of a second century copy. Okay? So you have the first century. Who would have written in the first century? Well, all the writers of the New Testament, right? Well, then they started making copies, okay, to send out to the churches to, for individuals to have. And there are some who believe that this particular codex is a copy of a second century copy. Wow. So that means there could have been the original, a copy, and then what? The Sinaiticus. Wow. Wouldn't that be something? Okay, so uh, that, that's, you know, pretty interesting right there, okay? Uh, notice the name, Codex Sinaiticus. Uh, that name literally means the Sinai book. There is a monastery, and it's still there today, at the very foot of Mount Sinai. Okay, now that's where Moses received what? Received the law, didn't he? Okay, that, that mountain is still there, and it's on the uh, Sinaitic Peninsula. You can go there and visit it if you want to. Um, you'll take a whole day out of your trip to do it because it's very difficult to get there. And uh, when you get there, all you're going to see is a dry mountain. Okay? And this monastery, however, is at the foot of it. Notice it is the monastery of St. Catherine, uh, right at the foot of this uh, mountain. It is also among those who are uh, critics of the biblical text, okay, textual critics. They refer to this manuscript as Aleph, okay, Aleph. That's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Okay, so Aleph is the way they refer to it. So if you're reading uh, in any literature about something and you read about Aleph says this, or you read about uh, the book of Sinai, or you read about the Codex Sinaiticus, they're all the what? All the same thing, okay? Every one of them are exactly the same. Notice this discovery. Um, it is believed that uh, it was seen and kind of recognized for the first time by an Italian naturalist who was visiting the monastery. Okay, notice his name. Vitaliano Donati. Okay, he had visited the monastery, and as he was walking through the monastery, he sees this huge book over here. Okay, and he gets close enough to it to know what it's made of, to kind of look at uh, a couple of the pages, and to know that it's a Bible. Okay, and when he was writing about his journeys way back there, notice the date, 1761, he made mention of having seen this beautiful Bible in this monastery. But, guess what? Nobody had a clue as to really what it was, okay? Uh, it wasn't being circulated. Uh, it was just there in that mice. In fact, it was on a top shelf as if it had just been put away for years and years and years in that monastery, okay? And uh, that day it happened to be out. He happened to see it, and he makes mention of it. But Constantine Tischendorf is um, the one who is referred to as the discoverer of the Codex Sinaiticus. Uh, he went to the monastery. He was, uh, he was on, a, on a mission, guys. He was going all over the world collecting as many of the manuscripts as he could possibly find. Okay, So uh, he would just visit this place and this place and this place and this place and he was trying to collect as many manuscripts of the Bible as he could. And he gets to the monastery and all of a sudden they bring him out like 129 pages of this book. Can you imagine? Now, this man is well uh, read in the Greek, so he, you know, he just opens it up and he starts reading and he can't believe his eyes. You've got to be kidding me. And so they got to testing it. They got to uh, you know, looking at you know, how old is this particular manuscript. Now remember, this is 18 what? 
Okay, it's 1844. Guys, that, that's, that's a long way from the second century, isn't it? Okay. And the more they tested it, the more they looked at it, they dated the book as the middle of the third, I mean the middle of the fourth century. Okay, 350 A.D. It was the earliest manuscript that they had in existence at the time. The others were like 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th century manuscripts. Now, they did have a few fragments. Okay, and remember I talked about those little pieces, like the John Rylands fragment. Okay, it only has a few words written on it. Okay, they didn't have an entire book, an entire Bible like this one. Okay, and all of a sudden they date it and they say, wow, this thing goes all the way back to the middle of the 4th century. We're at around 350 A.D. There couldn't have been that many copies made from the original until this particular volume. Okay? So, boy, I tell you what, excitement. They were very excited about it. Uh, Tischendorf went back to the monastery for th two other trips. So he made three trips. And he eventually published the Codex. The Codex. Okay? And uh, it became known as the Codex Sinaiticus. Now, the question that we need to ask ourselves is, what's in it? Right? What's in this Codex Sinaiticus? Well, there is the Old Testament and there is the New Testament. Okay? But what's... what's there of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Notice what it says. Half of the Old Testament is present. Okay? Now, the first half of the Old Testament is not there. From Genesis all the way to 1 Chronicles, not there. Okay? Somewhere along the line, it's been lost. So that part of the Codex is not there. Notice also, there are books of the Apocrypha in this Codex. Okay, books of the Apocrypha. And I've given you a list of them. Second Esdras, Tobit, Judith, First and Fourth Maccabees, and Sirach. All of those are the Apocryphal books. And they were included in this particular codex. Notice this next one. The whole New Testament. Now, put a little question mark there. Okay. What he means by that is all the books are there. Matthew through what? Matthew through Revelation, they're, they're all there, okay, but put a question, little question mark beside it because there are sections and portions of the New Testament that, see there, told you we wouldn't get long, <laughs> that aren't in this codex, okay, not, not big sections, but some little sections. There's also two early Christian uh, writings that are in there, and I've given you those, the Epistle of Barnabas and also the Shepherd of Hermas. And folks, those books are still in circulation today. If you want to go, if you just pull them up on the internet, you can read those books even today along with the Apocrypha. Okay, so you've got this very old manuscript, Greek manuscript, Koine Greek manuscript of half the Old Testament and what? All the New Testament, okay? And it dates back like three or four hundred years older than anything that they had at the time that was a codex like this. So, you think that discovery made an impact on the translation world? Oh, buddy, let me tell you, big one, okay? Um, like I said, you're going to have to come back next week for the rest of the story because we need to talk about the Codex Vaticanus and then we're going to get into... Um, you know, the goods and the bads, the pros and the cons of these two particular codexes uh, as they are used in the translation of Bibles today. Okay? Uh, questions, comments? <clears throat> Larry? You know, it's interesting that, that uh, all the books of the New Testament were found. Jesus said, my word will not pass away. Mm -hmm. so that part of it we know has been fulfilled. Right. And just think about it, guys. Uh, um, now, the Vaticanus, I'll, I'll just give you a little brief intro to the Vaticanus. The Vaticanus existed, and they knew about it, at least it was on a registry, long before the uh, Sinaiticus. All right? But it wasn't, re it wasn't revealed until later on. Okay? Um, and, um, uh, and so, you know, here these books are. They're out there. And yet nobody what? 
Nobody knows they're in existence. And when they're finally discovered, boy, it changes radically the translation uh, of the Word of God. Okay? Especially when uh, Westcott and Hort did their thing to the text. Okay? And so, uh, now you have to remember this. Westcott and Hort hated what is referred to as the majority text and the text is receptive. I mean, hated it. They despised it. And uh, that, that's an interesting concept. So it's not surprising that they would get in there and... Uh, change the text because they didn't like the old text, and uh, so we'll we'll talk about it, and uh, maybe we won't get too burdened down in all the. I mean, we could just get in this pretty deep. There's books and books written on this kind of stuff. Okay, and I'll try to keep it simple as I can, but it's not easy. All right, questions, comments. My biggest concern is when you open your Bible and it says the two oldest manuscripts don't have this in there, and you go, "Wow, should this even be in the Bible?" I've got, uh, I had a young preacher tell me one day that uh, I told him, you know, we're supposed to have all the Bible. And he says, well, what if the King James Version has additions? Is it just as wrong to add to as it is to take from? Okay, so is the King James Version, does it have additions to the Word of God? Okay, that's kind of an interesting question, isn't it? So we'll deal with a little bit of that in our next few lessons.